The Apostle Paul was reproving the ministers and the Christians of Corinth, saying, look, there's divisions among you because some of you are sinful. Some of you are gross in sin. Some of you are not. There's a division. There's a faction among you. This sin is so bad that even the bad people do not even do it. What was the specific sin? Well, we see there at the very end of verse 1, it was a relationship. It was not even allowed in that culture. Such marriages and mixtures were not allowed even among civil or cultivated unions and nations. The Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary said that it's a gross sin that the son connected with his stepmother while his father was still alive. We also see this in Leviticus 18.8, 2 Corinthians 7.12. She perhaps was a heathen, the son was obviously a heathen, for which reason he does not direct his rebuke against her, but against the men at this point. You have done something wrong. So the son, although he was a heathenist, there's connotation here that possibly he knew better, that he was with the church, and that he was doing something wrong. We need to understand that sin is gross. Now, this specific sin, yeah, we can all raise hands and be like, yeah, that's nasty, we don't do that, that's weird. All sin is gross. We need to understand that sin is not only gross, but sin, understand that sin is contagious, very contagious. Did anybody ever have the flu or funk in the past six months? Who here had a flu or funk or was in a household of flu or funk? I mean, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The church attendance showed it, too. I mean, we had people that were in and out and out, and then some people that were gone for a while, like, what happened to them? And they're just, they're quarantined in their home. I mean, there is such a flu and funk going on. And what happens in a family? Well, when one gets it, the other gets it, the other gets it. Not the Evans household, we quarantine you. Okay? I mean, you're in the bathroom alone. We'll slide food up underneath the door, and if it don't fit, you don't eat. <laughs> we just, we quarantine, all right? We, we don't do that. We try to get over it quick, so that's, that's how I was able to survive the, the, the epidemic that we had. But it was contagious. Sin the same way is contagious. Why? Because, don't be too holy right now. Sin is fun. People love doing sin. If you did not love doing sin, you would do it. You wouldn't do it. Sin is contagious like the laughter of a child. You ever seen a child laugh? Oh my goodness. Yesterday I was on a flight home the, with my mom. I took my mom to New Orleans for the very first time in her life. Which if you want to talk about sin, Bourbon Street, yeah. <laughs> Preacher and his mom walking on Bourbon Street on the good half, billing the rest of you joke. Yeah, goodness. But um, it, uh, awful, simple place. But we were on the ride home yesterday. It took us an hour. We sat in the plane for an hour before we took off. We actually jumped on the plane. We're well, not jump. You know, we all fly the walk. You know, because you get arrested if you jump on the plane. Uh, so you, you, you we're all gonna walk in. We got it out into the into the runway. And all of a sudden, we, we turn around and we come back. That's weird. Mom's like, does this happen all the time? Because mom's really, really skittish when it comes to flying on airplanes. Just telling you. I'm like, yeah, mom, this happens all the time. I'm like, oh my goodness, it never does. <laughs> I'm like, oh, she's, oh my goodness. So anyway, the father's like, uh, I like to uh, you know, inform you. There's a light that comes over. There's a door open. Door? We're about to take off and you left a door open?
affections. It says there in verse 2, you have become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, you've done something else. Listen to what Jamie Foster Brown said, actually. It says that you're puffed up with your own wisdom and knowledge and the eloquence of your favorite teachers at a time when you ought to be mourning at the scandal. Well, these people have gathered around teachers and approve what they do, and so they're like, oh, well, we're all right. They should be mourning. Paul mourned. Paul was sad because they were not sad. We ought to mourn over the transgressions of others. When other people sin, we should be sad. That's a good test of your Christianity. When you see sin, does it break your heart? Now, today, before I, before I spoke, I always fan through the news. Because I always want to know the current news. You know, congratulations, Lou. You know? Hey, you know, whatever. So, we, that was one good piece of news. The other good piece of news that they had were these superstars selling their homes. Everything else was just horrible. If you don't see some of this horribleness, if it doesn't break your heart, it's a test of your Christianity. It should break you. It should make you sad that other people are sinful, that other people are doing wrong things. We should care. Why should we mourn? Because Jesus said to you. He said it's a good thing in Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And that's not talking about mourning over somebody that has died. By the way, we hear that verse in, in, in funerals a lot. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That verse has nothing to do with somebody dead. Physically dead. It has everything to do with somebody spiritually dead. If you look at the Beatitudes, it's not just a one letter that we pull out of context like, oh, I'm that Beatitude, or I'm that Beatitude. No, it's a hierarchy of your Christian walk. Blessed are those that mourn. You'll be comforted. So why should we mourn? Because Jesus said it's good. Number two, it fights apathy. If you're a really go-getting kind of person, you really like to go do stuff, you really like, ah, we've got to take this challenge on. To run into somebody that's apathetic, like, ah, if we just ignored it, it'll go away. That gets underneath your skin. Like, I'm not here to ignore stuff. I've been called out by God to, to live life and to act. When sin is present, our action must not be apathetic. The problem with most Christian groups, churches, and Christian fellowships around is that we're apathetic to sin. Oh, that's just how that person is. You'll get used to them. I don't want to get used to them. I don't want to get used to that sin. Please. I think that God, that Christ has a higher standard for the church today. But yet we don't want to hit that mark. Why? Because in our American Western life, we're lazy. And we want to be politically correct, but we translate that as an apathetic. We just ignore it and go away. They're not affecting my life. Sin is contagious. Sin is contagious. And if you're still having a struggle with that, do you think drunkenness is sin? Well, yeah, of course, you're drunk. you're drinking one drink. No, of course not. But, but drunkenness, yeah, it's a sin. If that person just behind the wheel of a car, does it become your business? Yes, it does. Easy right there. I want everybody to do me a favor. At the Macarena, I want you to stick your hands down. <laughs> you, got, you got something expensive in your lap, you want to put it on the floor. If you don't want it anywhere, just put it in the floor. Okay, tablet, phone, baby, just put it in the floor. <laughs> God wants to shake them out of their apathy 
Paul knew the seriousness of sin and continued to write in 1 Corinthians 5 9. He said, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not all, uh, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with covetous or swindlers or idolaters, for them you would have to go out of the world. You see what he said? I'm not talking about people of the world, secular people. That's not what I'm talking about here. Because it's our job to engage the sinful world and to let them know that Jesus lives and Jesus loves and Jesus heals. That's our job. That's not what Paul is talking about. Verse 11, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. You see the difference he's making. There are people that say, man, I'm a Christian, but I do this. I'm a Christian, but I sin this way. I'm a Christian, but I got to accept this. Don't associate with those people. They're perverse in their mind. They're sinful in their mind. Paul continues to say, if he is an immoral person or a covetous or a doctor or a violent or a drunk or a swindler, not even eat with such a one. Don't even eat with them. Don't let anybody know that you're around that person. Don't even be around that person. Verse 13. But those who are outside, God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourself. The fact of it, a little bit ruins the whole. A little leaven in bread ruins the whole. Has anybody ever made cookies like, like not, not from the little Pillsbury Doughboy where you just slice up the two, though it, but you've like made, you made it from scratch, as we say. You made bread from scratch. You're, you know what I'm talking about. You got the big lump of dough. Okay? You're moving it around, moving around, moving around. A lot of people are like, man, Granny used to do that, right? It looks so good. What if as a child you went in there and you saw Granny doing it? She had a little salt, a little sugar, a little powder, whatever she put in it. Then she put in a little dog food. <laughs> Did any of y'all ask what Granny used? <laughs> None of y'all know. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Now you laugh, but would you still eat Granny's biscuits?
Husbands, it is your job to stand up for your bride, to be the warrior that fights for her heart and her emotions, and never let someone abuse her that way. It is your job. It is your job. I think rightly so, too, as, as I have seen throughout marital counselings, and I've seen in my life, and in other people's lives, it's harder for our ladies emotionally to connect, disconnect. Guys, it's our job to protect our home. We must purge cooperatively. Sin is contagious. Sin is gross. And we have got to respond to the nastiness of sin. We can't be a people that just sit back and let it happen. There's one Sunday morning this old cowboy went to a church. He got there before the church services began. It was a nice big fancy church. And although this man had worn his own clothes, he still walked in. He had his jeans on, denim shirt, boots. That kind of like us this morning, actually. Worn and ragged, though. He was in beat-up clothes. He had his old hat in his hand. He had his old Bible in the other. He entered this church as very upscale. Had the chandeliers. Everything was beautiful. Everything smelled right. It was just awesome and exquisite. The people of the congregation were in their Sunday best. Have you ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. I always have to tell pastors that, like, when Evan's coming, your Sunday best. I'm like, I don't think you know what that means to me. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say it used to be an iron pair of pants and a clean T-shirt. I don't even iron my clothes anymore, so it's just clean clothes. That's about it. <laughs> they were all in their Sunday best. Their suits, their, their, their thread count in their suits were more threads than my house has ever seen before. And so now the old cowboy was leaving the church after the whole service and after seeing all the fine stuff. And the preacher approached him and asked the cowboy to do him a favor. He asked him this. Before you come back in here again, have a talk with God and ask him what he thinks will be an appropriate attire for worship in church. The cowboy, the old cowboy, assured him, all right. I will. The next Sunday, the cowboy showed back up. Wearing the same ragged jeans, boots, and hat, once again, completely shunned and ignored by the people. The preacher approached the cowboy and said this, I thought I asked you to speak to God before you came back to our church. I did, replied the old cowboy. And what was his reply, asked the preacher? Well, sir, God told me that he didn't have a clue what I should wear because he said he'd never been in this church before. <laughs> Jerusalem. 
They presented him with the wine of honor as a king should have. But instead of a golden cup, he was on a sponge, on a staff, on a spear. As he cried, I thirst. They honored him with a guard of honor who showed their esteem by gambling over his possession. A throne of honor was given to our Jesus, allowing him to hang on a tree for you and I. He was even given the title of honor, King of the Jews. But that the blinded nation distinctly repudiated and really called him the King of Thieves and preferring the real sinner, Barabbas. Our sin disrespects our Jesus in the same way. We must not be a people that get arrogant as the, as the passage tells us. That I can do what I want. Be forgiven later. The Lord still loves me. Sin is now.